This is the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast. This is VP. We are a solutions-based podcast, diving into the world of contrarian investing and alternative finance. You can find us hosted on the No Nonsense Forex YouTube channel, nonsenseforex.com, and podcast players everywhere. Episode 1 Tweezy is brought to us by Bybit. Traders, you have under 12 days to sign up for the World Series of Trading with an $8 million prize pool. There's a Lamborghini in there somewhere. It's pretty wild. Now, I know no-nonsense Forex traders aren't really built for this, but you cannot win if you don't play. So go down to the description. You'll see the blog that tells you all about Bybit. You can sign up and get ready there. I also have a direct link to the contest itself if you want to check it out. And it has all the rules down below at the bottom and a little icon um, for live help if you need that as well. People were asking about that this week. But whether you want to enter the contest or not, you're still getting one of the world's best crypto exchanges, a USDT bonus just for making your first trade, a robust spot market where you can buy just about anything you want, and beneficial promotions going on all the time. So click either of the links down below and get yourself signed up because membership has its rewards. It is the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast, and I have a feeling this is going to be one of those episodes that I refer back to often. So get ready for it. And I didn't really know how to start this episode. Um, I guess I'll start by saying uh, what I've said before, and uh, that oil is pretty much everything. The way we all live our lives is directly (laughs) due to oil consumption and what it has led to over the past 150 years. Just look out your window right now. Your neighborhood would not look like this at all had it not have been for copious amounts of oil and the consumption thereof. And there is a very clear difference between the countries that get to use all the oil and the countries that do not. Oil is everything. Unless you're one of those two or three countries like Iceland or Paraguay that has, you know, all hydroelectric, uh, which it takes oil to build those things up, by the way, uh, then you are still very, very, very dependent on oil, despite what anybody says. So now that's out of the way. Uh, What is the energy cliff? So the energy cliff is... An idea, I guess, um, brought up by a man named Steve St. Angelo, who runs the uh, SRS Rocco Report, which uh, I subscribe to, actually. Uh, For $10 a month, you get really, really good information that I don't get most places. And Steve has been a very good predictor of all things when it comes to energy, gold, silver. Uh, He's he's a very, very good resource, uh, but he is paid, so I have to be kind of careful with what I say here. Uh, But it's interesting because I haven't seen anybody come in and refute this yet to say, no, you know, everything's great, we'll all be fine. But mark my words, this should become a much bigger talking point as the months and years progress. So I guess the best way to define it, you know, maybe cliff's not a great word, but um, because the world is, uh, the, the lines are starting to cross. You know, the world consumes a lot of energy, but it was always fine because we always produced enough. That last part about producing enough is about to come to an end uh, for the first time in our lives. Now, does it go directly off of a cliff? No, but what Steve had said is think about like what Europe was going through with natural gas. And I say was because it doesn't seem like they're going through it now, but it's going to be one of those things to where there's going to be a huge oversupply, and then there's going to be a huge undersupply. And this is going to go back and forth, back and forth. So instead of just having energy all the time, we're going to go through periods where we have an excess, and then periods of where we have a complete lack. And this is going to fluctuate back and forth. And Steve is predicting this to come full-blown around the year 2025, but he said it could come a lot sooner. Now again, it's a prediction. Predictions are what they are. Um, But let's talk about how this comes about, what the effects are, and then, as always on this podcast, what we can do about it. Because I do give this prediction some credence, and here is why. So, in the United States alone, uh, we reached, we've already reached peak conventional oil um, back in 2006. And so, things could have gotten really bad, you know, a few years later, but we got bailed out by the shale industry. And shale is uh, a lower quality oil, but it was enough to get us by for a long time. And when I say us, I don't just mean the United States. Since 2006, anywhere from 80 to 90% of the entire world's new oil discovery was shale oil in the United States. 
So think about that. The world has not really found any more oil than it has already found for the last 15 years or so. And so when you think about this oil and the natural gas that spawns from it, you know, this is really, really significant. Because another interesting fact is that all throughout this entire century, the United States has pretty much flatlined in terms of how much energy it actually uses. Now, this might sound crazy, but if you think about it, too, the United States doesn't really manufacture a whole lot. You know, a lot of that's been replaced by tech, which does use energy, but it uses a lot less. So there's that, and I suppose that's good, but here's the problem. This is not the case in most of the rest of the world. In many cases, it has been going up a lot since the year 2000, notably a place like China. So if you were to look at it like a chart, like technical analysis, think of it as just a, a simple moving average to where China's moving average was very low in the year 2000, and then it slowly started to go up, then it went up a whole lot, and then it is where it is right now, and that's the amount of consumption they use. And you can do this for any country. You know, there's only so much oil and natural gas to go around, and so many developed countries have now gotten used to using a certain amount whether it's the United States, which is flatlined, or whether it's China, which has been exponentially up for a long time now. Their baseline is where it is now, and that is the society they run. Now, you do have alternative forms of energy now, but one, you need oil to build those things. And two, as we've discussed on the show, they are just not worthy replacements yet. So oil is still everything. Oil is society. Society runs on oil, and the problem is... That shale boom I talked about, it's over. It's been over. We've not only peaked in conventional oil years ago, we've peaked in shale. And now we're losing a lot of that at a rate of 45% a year. Now again, we can still get by on what we have, but what Steve St. Angelo is saying is those, the line of consumption and production is going to cross. He's saying the year 2025. And when it does, the energy is just not going to be there to run the societies we currently have. And now the mere idea of this just seems absurd to so many people because we've never known any different. You know, if you are from a Western developed country, you only know one way of living. And that is when the energy is always on and things are functioning perfectly because of it. Energy is not infinite. We are very, very far away from cold fusion or whatever discoveries they say they're, they've already made. You know, those things take a long time to test and implement. You know, we will be relying on oil for a very long time. And what will we do when there's no longer enough of it? Well, like I said before, the prediction is what you see in Europe with natural gas. Now, if they didn't get super lucky and have a, a record warm winter, you know, we would be singing a different tune right now, probably. We would really be seeing what those effects are. So because everybody's still fat and happy and comfortable, you know, there's, there's not a narrative here yet, but there's probably going to be. So let's talk about the effects of something like this happening. Now, first of all, uh, is this good or bad for world economies? It's obviously really, really bad. Economies, just like society, runs on oil, like it or not. And if we are already in some type of recession by the time this happens, do not expect recovery anytime soon. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know, but the price of oil is usually pretty correlated to what the economy does. So when the economy falls, oil tends to fall with it because you have a demand drop. But when, but this, this has always been during times where we had enough oil to go around. We're talking about a time where we won't anymore. So we may have this horrible combination of a falling economy and expensive energy prices. Again, we've never seen something like this before. We have no precedent, but you know, I'm just kind of spitballing here. I don't think a world with a falling economy and high energy prices is going to be a good thing. Even if we have a situation to where we have these wild fluctuations, to where we have too much, then too little, then too much, then too little, that's not good either. Now, this will probably vary wildly by country. Now, you've seen it in the last five years. There's been a, a new positioning on the game board in terms of oil and access to it, and who gets it where, and from whom. You know, if, if the prices really do go up like this, and access goes down at the same time, 
there's only so much to go around, and only certain countries are going to have access to, and it's going to be who pays the, the highest price and who's friends with whom. So for all those people thinking there's going to be this renaissance in you know certain places in sub-Saharan Africa and South America, I got news for you. <laughs> you can't do shit without oil, and they are going to be priced out. So whether this is something you believe in or not, this is something you should certainly be paying attention to. The energy market in general is always something I think we should be paying attention to. You know, not just as investors, but as human beings that need to chart out what the next five to 10 years of our life is going to look like. But since we are a solutions-based contrarian investing podcast, let's go ahead and talk about that. Now, when it comes to what to do with oil investing, I have... No idea. Um, I'm no longer in the oil market in terms of investing. Um, Trading, I still do from time to time, even though trading has been rough. Uh, But yeah, as far as investing goes, I'm just, I'm not in it at all. And I don't plan on being in the oil market because it's just too, uh, too unpredictable at this point. In terms of natural gas, I got in low, price dropped lower. I'm going to buy more and I'm just going to sit back and wait because that's all you can do. But I'm willing to wait for something that already fluctuates up and down a lot on its own, um, but we'll absolutely be doing that in the future. So in terms of pure oil and and gas plays, that's what I'm personally looking at there. As far as what to do as a human being, I've said this before, have cash on you, can't use crypto without energy. I don't know if you'll be able to use credit card processors without energy or internet like I, I hope we don't see a world like this but some places are going to experience this and it was inevitable with the growth of our planet that usage of energy was going to exceed actual capacity at some point you know all this prediction is doing is putting a date on it so whenever that day comes and it almost certainly will in my lifetime I'm, I'm I want to make sure I'm ready for it before the rush and we've had these conversations before good luck trying to transact gold and silver coins you know, good luck bartering with cigarettes and ammunition if the person you're buying something from doesn't want those things. Cash is king here. And just from a pure survival standpoint and prepping standpoint, cash is what you want to have. Now, in terms of the miners, this is where it gets really, really interesting. I'm less bullish on gold miners than I would be anywhere else. Um, gold miners already are having some problems with production with oil prices where they are right now. If you guys know what's going on with Newmont, that's been really ugly. You know, you, you got to be able to be profitable when you extract these things out of the ground. Now, as the price of gold keeps going up, this gets better for the miners, of course. But you know, with gold right around 2000 I didn't expect to see some of the problems I'm seeing. Um, now, they haven't affected any of my investments yet. But with a realistic energy crisis looming, um, it probably wouldn't be the first place I would want to be. Now, silver is interesting. I don't know if you've heard me talk about this before, but, you know, let's say your all-in sustainable cost is right around $16 silver, and let's just pretend the price of silver is $18 an ounce. Well, that's a $2 profit margin. Now, if that price of silver goes to $20, well, then you've just doubled your profit margin. And then every time it does that again, it just keeps doubling and doubling. That's really good for silver miners. And the difference between silver and gold miners is we don't really need gold the way we need silver. Now, even in an energy crisis, silver, because silver is used for a lot of energy producing things, uh, machinery, solar panels, things like that, I would still be pretty bullish on them and the miners because the cheapest silver is always in the ground. Now, that being said, During an energy crisis like this, I think the best, safest play that still has a lot of upside is physical silver, and I might actually be compelled to buy some, just in case the miners can't operate. Because remember, mining is very energy intensive. It's very oil intensive because all the diesel fuel they use, all the energy it takes to process these things. You know, this is something contrarian investors really have to look closely at. Now over to uranium, I can see the price of uranium really catching a bid if something like this happens. Now the miners, as they stand right now, aren't really making a lot of money, if any money. So the price would certainly have to go up for us to see any kind of real renaissance in this sector because of something like this. I think the price of uranium is going to go up anyway, no matter what. It has done nothing but go up slowly for the last five years or so. 
And I think something like this really could accelerate it. But again, remember, these are mining companies, so you have to do the math. This is one of those times where the people who don't do their due diligence and just lazily, you know, ape into these things are in for a really rude awakening. You know, you have to know what you own. There's going to be people out there getting bent out of shape because their mining stocks crashed because they chose the wrong ones, and they're going to get all mad to where the people who did proper due diligence are probably going to do very well. There's going to be a dichotomy here when these things begin to take off. So if there are any takeaways from this episode so far, it's one, have cash, two, know what you own. Uh, finally, something like copper. Um, I don't know. I mean, with a down economy and an energy crisis, what exactly are we going to be building? You know, copper is one of those things that I always said, really stock up on these things when price drops, and I think it will. But I still have some exposure here in case I'm wrong, because the copper run is not going to be a run you want to miss out on. So contrarians, I don't want you to sit back and worry about something like this, but I want you to be aware of it and aware of the possibility of it and understand that the facts are there and the numbers are there. Timing, as always, is the one thing we can never predict. Uh, But when it comes to something like this with oil, which is everything, uh, do you want to be crazy or would you rather be early?